Patinas are deliberate or natural changes in the color of your metal due to oxidation. Some metals, such as 24 karat gold, fine silver, titanium, and platinum, are naturally resistant to oxidation, and it's part of their attraction as a material for adornment. However, most of the metals we use in this studio are copper-based, and copper is very willing to combine with oxygen and anything else that'll take one of its extra electrons. In fact, until the available copper at the surface has found something to partner with, it isn't entirely chemically stable. Once it does, it's happy. Compare this to iron, which is never really satisfied and will rust away completely. So, there are many options for altering the color of the copper, brass, nickel, and bronze we work with. And in addition to expanding your color and visual texture palette, patinas chemically stabilize the surface of your metal, controlling and slowing the oxidation that would otherwise happen whether you like it or not. In fact, we have a whole cookbook of patina recipes that you can browse if you're interested, but most take chemical ingredients that we don't keep on hand. There are still many ways to color your metal though, and many use little more than household chemicals, time, and or heat to create them. These samples were produced by a student working from home during the quarantine. I'll be showing you three patinas that are easy, quick, and available in our shop. A liver of sulfur chemical patina on copper. A low heat patina on brass. and a high heat patina on copper. Before applying any patina, finish all the other work on your piece. The oxides are very soft and easy to damage, and if you try to do a lot with the metal after you apply them, you'll likely scratch them. Just before applying your patina, clean your metal of existing oxides by pickling it, and gently clean and degrease it with soap, water, and a clean brass brush. Wear rubber gloves while you do this to avoid depositing fresh fingerprints. To know when the metal is really clean, watch how the water flows over the surface. If it's still dirty, the water breaks into rivulets, leaving most of the surface dry. When it's clean, the water clings to the surface, spreading out and sheeting down more evenly. Dry your metal or immerse it in clean water to keep it from re-oxidizing. Liver of sulfur is a chemical oxidizer that comes in concentrated solid form that you dissolve in water to create a solution. It works well on sterling silver, copper, and bronze, but only sporadically on brass. Put on rubber gloves and safety glasses. This is pretty toxic stuff in its solid and concentrated form. You don't want to ingest it or touch it with your skin. Choose a container that will fit your piece closely and fill the container with just enough cool water to cover your piece. Try to make as little solution as possible. Remove your piece from the water and carefully dry your hands. Carefully pry the lid off the container of liver of sulfur using a paint key. Use a dry pair of tongs or tweezers to select a lump. Don't get moisture in the can it will break down the concentrate and neutralize it. A volume the size of a pea will usually be enough for a half liter of solution. In this video, I'm making maybe 100 milliliters, so I'm just using a small shard of the concentrate. If you need a smaller piece, dig down in the can. The little stuff ends up at the bottom. If you're having a hard time finding small enough pieces, put the lid back on firmly. Turn the can upside down and shake it gently for a few seconds. You're not trying to break the crystals into smaller pieces. Shaking it like this just makes the sizes trade places in the can. Turn it back over, take off the lid, and enjoy the greater range of options.
Drop the rock in the water and let it dissolve. You can agitate the liquid to speed this up. Close up the liver of sulfur can by placing the lid back into position and leaning on it until it pops back into its groove. By the way, this stuff stinks, and it should. If you open the can and it doesn't stink of rotten eggs, it's because the concentrate has been exposed to air and humidity, slowly decaying until it's chemically inert. Dead liver of sulfur won't even dissolve, and it certainly won't color your metal. Good liver of sulfur crystals have defined edges and fairly smooth surfaces and are a nasty yellow-green color. Dead crystals are more gray, khaki, ashy, and cracked. This usually happens because the last user didn't seal the can back up properly or someone wrecked the lid taking it off or putting it back on. Only use the paint key to remove the lid. And to close it, only use your hand to lean on it until it pops back into place. Don't use a hammer or any other tool to close the can. And once it's fully dissolved, check the color of the solution. It should be a pale yellow like Mountain Dew. If it's too dark, the chemical reaction with your metal will happen too fast for you to control, and it usually rubs off like soot. Add water to dilute it. Too light, and you may be waiting a while for the reaction, but you'll still get one. Better to err on the side of caution. This oxide is pretty chemically durable. If you mess up, pickling alone won't take it off. You'll have to anneal the piece to burn off the old patina, pickle and scrub it thoroughly, and go back to the start. It's an additional reason to use a weak solution. It slows things down, and you'll be able to creep up on what you want instead of blowing right past it. Keep your gloves on to place your piece into the solution. Keep your bare skin out of the solution, but if you do get it on your hands, it'll just dry out your skin and make you smell like rotten eggs, not otherwise harm you. Just wash it off. With a well-diluted solution, the first patinas that develop will have swirls of iridescent greens, blues, purples, grays, browns, and reds. If you take out your piece right away and rinse it, you can keep most of these colors. The liver of sulfur can be applied in other ways too. Some people sponge, paint, or daub the solution on to control where it goes. Some people use waterproof masks to keep hearts clean of it. Some artists have even drawn on their metal with the dry rocks themselves. You can also put the patina on and then scratch or sand back through it to create clean areas, fades, or high contrast cross-hatching textures. I wasn't quite quick enough getting it out and rinsing off the solution to catch the colors you see in the slow-mo. Luckily, they often come back if you dip it again, and this time I did it much more quickly. Wash the piece with your fingers in soap and water to remove any remaining loose oxides, and to make sure there isn't any chemically active liver of sulfur still sitting on the surface. Dry the piece so it doesn't water spot. On this roller printed piece, I'm going for the more even, rich, dark brown to black that liver of sulfur is capable of. So I'm leaving the piece in the solution until the iridescent colors darken and even out. Then remove the piece, rinse it, and gently scrub it with a soapy brass brush to remove any unattached oxides. Because the oxides are soft, some will scrub off, exposing your metal and lightening the patina. If you like what you have, you can stop at this point. If you want a darker patina, put it back in the solution and repeat the process of darkening and gently scrubbing until it reaches the intensity you want. Scrubbing each time gets rid of the fragile oxides and lightens the patina, but exposes your metal surface to give new oxide layers a better grip, resulting in a richer, more durable patina. 
On the other hand, just chucking it into a strong solution till it goes black makes a chalky, fragile oxide that will rub off on your fingers. If you have a dramatic texture, you might consider scrubbing with steel wool instead of the brass brush. It will take some of the oxides off the top surfaces of the texture while leaving them in the recesses, bumping up the contrast and making your texture really pop. Liveros Sulfur Solution exposed to air has a pretty short shelf life, just a few hours at best. If you plan to use it again, put an airtight lid on it and label it with what it is and when you made it. Left exposed, it breaks down, neutralizing itself. It turns cloudy yellow, then cloudy white, and finally clear and colorless except for a white precipitate at the bottom of the container. Once it turns cloudy, it's pretty useless. Dispose of it in the labeled five gallon bucket provided for the purpose under the counter to the left of the sink. Once you've disposed of your used liver of sulfur, clean the beaker thoroughly and hang it up. Clean all your tools and put them away as well. And if anybody's left old jars of liver of sulfur sitting and decaying on the side of the sink, be a good steward and scrub those out as well. By the way, one of the reasons I teach you this smelly patina is because even though the solid form is toxic, the solution is much less so. And once it's decayed to the final clear and colorless stage, it's harmless. At home, it can be dumped down your sink or poured on your garden, especially if your plants need sulfur. So it's a good one for small scale or in-home studios where disposing of chemical wastes is a problem. Heat patinas are just metal, heat, and air. They basically just speed up the oxidation that would have happened naturally and give you control over the result. Any heat source will work. A heat gun, a torch, an oven, the inside of your car. The heat is just getting the metal excited and speeding things up. Some patinas develop at low temperatures and some at high. Yellow brass, which is otherwise fairly resistant to oxidation, will make beautiful iridescent blues, greens, and purples at relatively low temperatures. Pickle and degrease your metal. The patina is made from metal and air. If your piece is surrounded by air, you'll have a better chance of getting a similar patina on both sides. If you lay it down against a surface, it will still make a patina, but it will be different, and sometimes better, on the underside. So prop your metal up so only its edges are touching, or lay it down on a clean fireproof surface. If using a torch, gently warm the metal with the torch for a few seconds, and then remove the heat. Let air get to your metal and give the oxide a chance to develop. If nothing much is happening, warm it again. Repeat this until you start seeing the colors develop. Keep in mind that the metal will still be hot, so the patina will still be developing. Once you see the colors develop, stop heating it and lay the metal on a cool surface to slow further developments. Don't quench it and don't wash it. Water is a solvent, so you'll lose most of your color if you do. 
If you don't get what you want, pickle, scrub, and try again. It's easy to repeat this process. A really beautiful patina can be made on copper by heating it well beyond its annealing point while starving it of oxygen. The results are streaks and blotches of intense reds, golds, oranges, grays, and blacks. Because this happens at such a high temp, you can't do it on anything with solder joints, and it will be very well annealed, so it's not a good choice for fragile pieces. Pickle and degrease your metal. Set up a clean fire brick or soldering pad over the edge of a quenching pan like the deck of a swimming pool. Lay your piece on the brick and surround it with other bricks. This will help it heat up faster and help keep oxygen away. Heat it using a torch large enough to engulf the piece. The flame helps keep oxygen from getting to the piece. Nuke it until it glows a bright yellow orange. Keep the torch on it while you pick it up with copper tongs or nudge it into the water. Turn off the torch. Fish your piece out of the quench and rub it clean with your fingers and running water. If you like what you got, you're done. If not, pickle scrub and try again. This is another one where it's really easy to repeat the process. Don't try this on any other metal. It only works on copper because it's reactive and pure. If you use a different metal, you might just melt it and you'll certainly burn away some of the zinc, tin, nickel, or other metals in the alloy.